Well, uh, as people file in, uh, we can at least start our introduction. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for logging on to this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I'm a programming librarian here at Cary. Uh, before we begin, please let me know in the chat if you have any technical issues that I can try to resolve. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker tonight, please save them for the end and we will address them. Uh, you can send those uh, via the Q&A button. Tonight is part of a series of lectures in which the library partners with Lexington Living Landscapes to bring experts in landscape and conservation issues to the public. So now please welcome from the organization, Sarah Bothwell Allen. Thanks, Matt. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad to have you with us to learn more about this important topic. I'm Sarah Bothwell Allen with Lexington Living Landscapes. And before I introduce Dr. Evans and turn the floor over to her, I wanna take a minute, a minute to tell you about us because I think we have some new audience members tonight. Um, Lexington Living Landscapes is a local volunteer nonprofit initiative launched in 2020 to promote more sustainable landscape pra landscaping practices in town more native plants, fewer invasive species, fewer chemicals, and more trees. We grew out of a collaboration between the town's Sustainable Lexington Committee and three nonprofits, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, Citizens for Lexington Conservation, and the Lexington Climate Action Network. You can learn more about us, including how to sign up for our newsletter at our website, which is www.lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org. Um, we are so thankful to have Dr. Sarah Evans here tonight, and as always, give our gratitude to Matt and the Cary Memorial Library for their ongoing partnership in hosting this series. And I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsoring organizations who are also enthusiastic about tonight's speaker. These are the Massachusetts Pollinator Network, Lexington Climate Action Network, Lexington Public Schools Green Team, and the PTOs, the parent-teacher organizations, of Estabrook, Bowman, and Diamond Schools. And tonight is back to school night for the middle schools. So those folks will be listening in a couple of days. I'm saying hi to them now for later. Um, after Dr. Evanson's presentation, we will have the question and answer session moderated by Martha Jens, another member of our Lexington Living Landscapes team. As Matt said, if you have a question, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Sarah Evans is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health and a member of the Institute for Exposomic Research at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Evans's research is focused on the impact of early life environmental exposures on nervous system development and child behavior. She's a trusted voice on the health effects of toxic chemicals and what individuals can do to protect their own health as well as how to advocate for healthier policies in their local communities. Um, so Dr. Evans, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will start to share my screen and I just want to congratulate um, Lexington Living Landscapes for um, doing the amazing work that you're doing. Um, it is so important. And um, tonight I'm gonna talk, let me just make sure that this is sharing. Um, I'm going to talk um, really broadly about lawn and garden chemicals and children's health. Does that look correct, Sarah? It does. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I have to say that this is a really popular topic as of late, which I think um, is really encouraging because a lot of communities um, across New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts have been taking steps to um, restrict pesticide use in their communities and also to educate um, residents. And so I think it's really, really great that Lexington Living Landscapes is doing that work as well. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, um, I am a part of the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, um, where I do research with the Institute for Exposomic Research, um, but I also work with a team of clinicians and scientists through our Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit um, and our New York State Children's Environmental Health Centers, which is a statewide network of um, clinicians and scientists who are specially trained in environmental health as it pertains to children, um, and we get a lot of our funding um, from the National Institutes of Health. So at Mount Sinai, um, I'm part of the um, Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health, um, which is a really great place to be. And so um, we do research 
um, cutting edge research to identify links between um, environmental exposures like pesticide chemicals and health outcomes um, in children and also in later life. Um, but we also see and treat patients um, who are exposed to um, environmental chemicals of concern. And then we do stuff like what I'm doing tonight, which I think is really important in the field of environmental health, which is to educate communities um, and turn the research into education and advocacy that promotes safer practices and policies. Um, and so the work that we do at Mount Sinai in environmental medicine is really motivated um, by the statistics that we see um, for the rise of chronic diseases. And this probably doesn't come as a surprise to many of you who I'm sure, unfortunately, know people who are afflicted by many of um, these illnesses like asthma, particularly childhood asthma. Autism rates have um, gone up a great degree um, over the last several decades. And all of these are rising at rates that really can't be explained just by genetic inheritance. And we know now that essentially every disease has some environmental component. So this is our focus at the Institute of Exposomics Research. Many of you have probably not heard of exposomics and that's okay. It's a new term um, for how we study health and the environment. And essentially we're looking at how all environmental factors, so those could be chemical or built environment or stressors, um, nutrition, how they interact with who you as a person are um, across your lifespan to affect your disease risk. So it's essentially moving away from thinking about one single chemical at a time um, to look really holistically at how our broad environment impacts our health and well-being. And this makes a lot of sense for the way that we study environmental health. So um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention conduct studies every other year called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where they look at the chemical body burden of a representative sample of Americans of all ages and backgrounds. And so what they find is that, um, and I should say that they we don't know how to test for every single chemical that's out there in the universe, um, but there are over 200 chemicals, synthetic chemicals, um, that are present in the bodies of most Americans. More than 40 of those are pesticide chemicals. Again, we can't test for all of them, um, but a number of them are pesticide chemicals. And importantly, many of those exposures are found to be higher in children and also in Black and Hispanic participants in these studies. So you can understand, I think, that we're exposed to many things at a time um, over long periods of time, often at very low doses. Um, and so what we're trying to do is understand how all of those things that get into our bodies are interacting with one another to influence health and disease. And so that's kind of important when we think about um, you know, a single pesticide chemical that we're putting onto our lawn, but we have to think about that in the context of all of the other exposures that we experience, whether they're other pesticides um, or different chemicals. So what are we talking about when we talk about pesticides? Again, this is a giant universe. I'm not sure what, um, uh, what all of the application practices are in the state of Massachusetts, but I know that um, the state of New York um, gathers data um, from pesticide applicators. And um, for the last year that they have data for in 2021, um, more than 4,500 different types of pesticides were applied across New York state by commercial applicators. So, you know, again, thinking about the number of products that are out there and things that we're exposed to, pesticides are a huge chemical universe and they encompass um, chemicals that target insects, weeds, rodents, fungus, and also include antimicrobials, things that we really became familiar with during COVID, um, like uh, disinfectants, like quaternary ammoniums and so on. And so they can be aerosolized sprays. Um, this image here is showing a house that's been tented for fumigation for termites. So they can, you know, we can use bombs and fumigants, um, granulars, um, granular pesticides and powders, um, stationary bait boxes um, like this cockroach bait box, and then also personal insect repellents. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as well as I said, things like antimicrobials, which I'm really not gonna touch on today. But again, pesticides is a very big um, class of products. 
<clears throat> so why are children uniquely vulnerable? Um, I already showed you that it looks like, um, you know, the data that we have from the CDC shows that children can have higher levels of some pesticides in their bodies. This actually makes sense based on their behaviors. So they're closer to the ground where pesticides settle. And of course they roll around in the grass and in the dirt. Um, they actually breathe faster than adults. So they take in a greater volume of air. And that means when we spray things like pesticide chemicals, they're more likely to breathe them in. They put objects in their mouths. They put their hands in their mouths and then they eat a less varied diet. Um, and so pesticide exposures through the diet may be higher, um, particularly because they tend to prefer, um, unfortunately, some of the conventionally grown produce that has been shown to have higher residues. So that's things like strawberries and apples um, that are found on the list of the dirty dozen. And so because they're, um, because their body systems are continually developing, um, that also puts them at greater risk and then they have longer years of life ahead of them um, to continue to be exposed. So in environmental health, we consider what we call windows of susceptibility. Um, so it's not only what you're exposed to, but when you're exposed to um, those things that determines how at risk you are. Uh, and these are really the periods of life where our body systems are developing or they're undergoing changes. And that just generally makes them more vulnerable. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some studies that have been done looking at pesticide exposure and health outcomes. And many of them look at the prenatal period. So things that the mom is exposed to that then impact um, the child's health later. And then also, of course, during infancy, early childhood, and on into adolescence and early adulthood, um, while the, where the reproductive system and the brain are still developing. So we really consider these to be some of the most sensitive times for pesticide exposure. And this is just one example. So DDT was widely used in the United States from the 1940s into the early 1970s, and it's since been banned, um, which is great, but it's a legacy chemical. So it's still present in our environment and even gets into some of our foods today. Um, but this is a study that looked at um, the age at which um, girls were exposed to DDT and then their risk of developing breast cancer later in life. And so what they found was that um, children who were who were exposed before the age of three or in utero while their mom was pregnant um, had a higher, a more than fivefold higher risk of developing premenopausal, so early onset breast cancer before the age of 50. Whereas if they were exposed um, during the pubertal period and into early childhood, um, into early adulthood, I'm sorry, um, their breast cancer um, risk went up, not for the earlier onset breast cancers, but for the later onset um, postmenopausal breast cancers. Um, so this is just one example of how we kind of isolate different developmental periods. And this tells us that, um, you know, the, the developing body is more sensitive to pesticide exposures at those times. Um, and, and another um, sort of complicated factor about how we look at pesticides and health is that pesticides um, can have what we call transgenerational effects. And so what these studies found was that um, if your grandmother was exposed to DDT, this actually increased your own risk, not her risk or her daughter's risk, but um, you as the granddaughter's risk of going on to develop breast cancer later in life. And that's because um, of impacts on the eggs of the developing daughter um, um, when she was exposed um, or impacted. And this went on to have a transgeneral impact on, on her daughter. So we know that um, you know, we have certain periods of time when we're at risk, particularly as children and during pregnancy, um, but it's important to note um, that pesticide applicators are also some um, of the individuals that are at the highest risk. And that a lot of what we know about the health risks of pesticide exposures comes from um, studies of agricultural workers and their families, like the agricultural health study. And I'll, I'll point to a couple of those later. Um, and you may also be familiar um, with a very um, high profile case of Dwayne Lee Johnson, who was a groundskeeper who used uh, Roundup containing the active ingredient glyphosate um, in his job, who went on to develop non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and he actually um, won a lawsuit um, with Monsanto, and there have been many that have followed. And I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the research that links um, glyphosate to the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. lymphoma. So um, a lot of what we know um, comes from these studies, 
not only of the applicators themselves, but of their families who live um, close to the agricultural lands um, and who may be exposed when the workers come home from work. Um, so how did we get into this mess is something that um, sort of always comes up that we've become sort of very dependent on um, using a lot of pesticide products and very, um, uh, it has become a societal norm to have a yard that sort of looks like this and is very uniform and green. And I think that there are probably a lot of people um, on this call today um, who are moving away from that. And um, and I think that's really awesome. Um, but this is a picture from Levittown, Long Island in New York um, from the 1940s um, when housing developments like this sprung up. Um, homes were very close to one another with um, small patches of grass. Um, and it was actually part of um, the agreement when you bought these homes that you would maintain the property in a perfect and uniform way. Um, and so out of that um, really kind of sprung up this big industry around um, herbicides um, and, and insecticides for residential use, and also um, a lot of gas powered um, lawn equipment, which is another um, topic that I've been talking to communities about a lot lately. Um, and so that's sort of where um, where a lot of this started to, to bring us to all of these, um, to the use of all these products. And this is kind of how it's going now, right? So with the changing climate, um, we're seeing an even greater need for um, a number of pesticide products. Um, we're seeing um, weed resistance. So um, in particular in agriculture, farmers are needing to apply um, different or more concentrated, um, stronger pesticide chemicals. Um, as the weeds are adapting to those chemicals, but um, the weeds are also um, becoming more prevalent and harder to kill due to um, rising temperatures with the changing climate, um, greater humidity, more rainfall. Um, and similarly, I'm going to talk um, towards the end of this talk about um, pest control, mosquitoes and ticks um, and insect-borne illness. Um, and so we're seeing with all of this increase in moisture and extreme storms, um, an increase in insect-borne diseases and insect activity that's really expanding um, into periods of the year when we had not seen it before and areas of the country where we had not seen it before. So the change in climate um, really can't be ignored when we're talking about um, pesticides. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the um, direct impacts on health um, with exposure to pesticides, um, but we really kind of need to think about um, all of the myriad health effects of climate change in general. Um, so like I said, changing pest control needs are leading us to use more pesticides. Um, and that in turn is um, really detrimental and increasing climate change. These are largely petroleum-based chemicals. A lot of water is used um, to generate them and in their application. Um, they are harmful to the soil and to the ocean, which both serve as important carbon sinks. Um, and so it's really kind of a vicious cycle. And as we exacerbate climate change, of course, we're seeing um, all these additional um, health effects, health effects that come from extreme heat, um, extreme weather, um, and so on. So here we are um, with this great need, continuing ongoing need for uh, pesticides on our properties. And there's really an assumption that um, if we can purchase these things on the shelf, they must be safe. Um, so assuming that you know a pesticide that's registered by the EPA, as all are required to be registered by the EPA, um, that you can find in your department store or your um or um your local hardware store, just like this, um, that they're safe for human use. Um, and we don't use um, very toxic persistent chemicals like DDT anymore, but we've replaced them with others. Um, and so people are often surprised to find that what they can get on the shelves in their local stores um, are actually associated with a number of, of health outcomes. And so I've listed some of those here. So um, this is data from the EPA. It's kind of old now, but this is the most recent data um, on the market share um, of pesticides sold in for the home and garden and also for agriculture. And you're probably familiar um, with many of these. You can see here glyphosate being um, the number one um, 
the number one pesticide used in the agriculture in, in agriculture at this time, um, for a total of 1.1 billion pounds of pesticides applied to 88 million homes at a 14 billion dollar um, 14 billion dollar industry, and that was in um, that data is from 2012. Um, so here we are now in 2023, and where this was a $14 billion industry in 2012, it is now um, a $26 billion industry. So um, just to demonstrate again how um, we're, we know more, actually, about the health impacts of pesticide chemicals, um, but we continue to apply more and more. So the question of you know how can these products uh, be approved by the EPA and make it onto the shelf, um, but still be harmful for health? And actually, to go back to this slide, um, go back one, um, no, sorry, two, um, just to show you that I, I didn't highlight um, some of the um, health concerns that we have, and I'll talk a little bit more about a few of these, but you can see that these pesticides that are applied on the order of millions of pounds um, are associated with um, harm to the nervous system, cancer, um, environmental impacts like aquatic tox toxicity, hormone disruption, and so on. So, sorry, there we go. Um, so, so some of the problems with the way in which um, pesticides are registered um, are that there's a lack of transparency in what's actually in them. So if you look at a pesticide label, you will see, um, and I'll show one of these later, that you will see um, that they tell you what the active ingredient is. And then um, because it's a trade secret, they do not need to tell you what any of the other um, components are. So you can't really know what you're being exposed to. Um, I mentioned that you know at any given time, we may have over 200 chemicals and 40 pesticides present in our bodies. Um, but um, the toxicity studies are done one, one chemical at a time. Um, so we're not looking at multiple pesticide exposures. And like one example um, is that some studies have shown for glyphosate, the active ingredient Roundup, um, that the, the full um, formulation of the glyphosate-based weed killer, like Roundup, is actually more toxic than just the glyphosate alone. But typically a study will only look at glyphosate. Um, so we're not really looking at what exposure to the full product does. Um, many pesticide chemicals that we use now that are on the shelf are under registration review to take into account any new data, but that takes many, many years. So while the data emerges to show that there may, may be harmful health effects to a chemical, um, the review process takes many years before that product may actually be removed from the shelf. Um, when you see this kind of toxicity labeling on a pesticide chemical, it only um, applies to you know high dose acute um, poisoning um, type exposures, but not to those low dose chronic exposures that we that we experience. And I think a, a, another really important point is that these pesticides can have very long half lives. So that's the amount of time that it takes for um, for the pesticide to degrade in the environment. Um, and so when the pesticide company says it's okay to return um, to your lawn after 24 hours or 48 hours, um, we know that um, particularly depending on weather conditions, things like UV light, um, rainfall, that um, those pesticide chemicals can persist in the soil for much longer um, than 24 hours. And so, um, for example, glyphosate has been um, found in, in soil for up to a year after application, and they persist even longer indoors. So if you track pesticides inside your home or apply pesticides inside your home, um, and they're not exposed to weather conditions that help them to break down, um, they can persist even longer. So I already mentioned some of the health risks. They really um, can affect pretty much all of the systems in the body. Um, so associated with um, changes in learning and behavior in children, um, increased risk of asthma, um, disruption of hormones and reproduction. Um, some are um, linked to cancer, diabetes and obesity, and also heart disease and stroke. Um, so there are many um, negative health outcomes. And it's also important to note, I'll, I'll mention some of the studies that um, many of these look at um, exposures that are experienced by the general public. So, so not, um, not necessarily pesticide applicators who are exposed to these on a daily basis at, at higher levels. 
And so I want to, so my, my background is actually in neuroscience and, and I um, generally study uh, early life and maternal exposures to chemicals and um, behavior in children. And so um, to me, this is particularly interesting to note. Um, this is maybe a little bit complicated, but these are two um, nerve cells, brain cells communicating with one another. Um, and all of these um, classes of insecticides, so um, organochlorines are actually the class that DDT belong to, um, pyrethroids and you know, nicotinoids, I'll talk about um, a little bit more because these are some of the most common insecticides that we use um, to repel um, insects and also in the garden for, for um, grubs, for example, many of you are probably familiar with these. Um, so we know actually that their mechanism of action is to interfere with the nervous system of insects. That's what they're designed to do. And so they similarly um, interfere with the nervous system, the mammalian nervous system and with and um, with the human um, nervous system. And this is just to show that all of these classes interfere with how to, to brain cells can communicate with one another. Um, so it's not surprising that we see the kinds of effects that we do on learning and behavior. So this is a chemical that probably many of you think about or have um, you know, maybe even had applied in, in your own on your own properties um, because it's very common again for insect control today. Um, and so um, often you will hear from landscaping companies um, that they're just using um, a natural chemical that comes from chrysanthemum flowers. That's how um, pyrethroids are often characterized. They're a synthetic form of a natural chemical called pyrethrum that comes from chrysanthemum flowers, but they are not pyrethrum from chrysanthemum flowers. So there's a lot of hand waving that goes on to say, um, this is a natural product and um, it's totally safe for children and pets. Um, but uh, unfortunately I'm here to say that that is not the case. And so it's not really pyrethrum that's present in these products. Um, it's usually one of, of these, um, permethrin, resmethrin, sumethrin, and so on. Um, and so they're widely used for tick, mosquito, um, cockroach, bed bug, um, and lice treatment. And um, they're often combined with um, synergist chemicals, so other chemicals that help um, make them stick around longer, make them more powerful, more potent, um, you know, than the natural pyrethrum chemical. They are toxic um, in the environment. Um, some of them have been classified as a likely human carcinogen. And as I said, um, not surprisingly, they've been associated with impaired cognition and behavior in children. A second very common class of um, chemicals that, um, that has actually recently been restricted for residential use um, in or consumer use in Massachusetts are neonicotinoids. A lot of um, municipalities and states are taking steps to try to restrict the use of neonicotinoids, but they can still be used, um, you know, typically by commercial applicators. Um, these, obviously, I'm sure many of you um, have thought about this in relation to pollinators. Uh, and so they've been shown to, to contribute potentially to the bee colony collapse, to be toxic to pollinators. Um, and so that has been a lot of the, the movement behind the restriction on these chemicals. Um, but they are also, again, uh, most of the US population is exposed, particularly long children, young children, and they've been found in cord blood and breast milk. And there are epidemiological studies to suggest that they are also toxic to the nervous system and linked to a host of other um, negative health outcomes. Um, so again, we, we actually know a little bit less, I think, about the human health effects of neonicotinoids than we do about some other classes, um, but most of the data that we have now suggests that um, they, they can be harmful to human health. And so this is just to um, show you that um, you don't have to read all of these papers, but um, just to make the point that we do have a body of scientific literature, peer-reviewed scientific studies, um, including studies, um, you know, not just done in rodents, but actually um, where they've looked at, um, again, you know, pregnant women or child exposure to pesticide and health outcomes. And so a number of um, a number of pesticide chemicals have been associated with things like decreased IQ, more behavioral problems in children, um, 
a really important study that was done by one of my colleagues at Mount Sinai, Megan Horton, um, actually looked at the um, brain structure of children by MRI. Um, and those who were exposed to higher levels of an organophosphate chemical chlorpyrifos, um, which is an insecti insecticide, um, showed actual changes in their brain structure. Um, and that is actually that is really remarkable to see and strong evidence that um, that these chemicals can affect brain development. And then also herbicides like 2,4-D have been associated um, with changes in the brain and behavior. Another major health outcome that we worry about with pesticide exposures um, is cancer. I already talked about DDT. Um, there are also studies showing that um, moms who reported um, insecticide and herbicide use during pregnancy, um, actually I should say this a different way, um, mothers of children who had um, brain tumors or le leukemia or lymphoma reported having used um, insecticide and herbicide um, were more likely to report having used these chemicals during pregnancy. So this is these are recall studies um, where moms recalled having used these chemicals during their pregnancy. Um, and so those are, those are subject to bias. Um, however, there are other studies um, like these that show um, that children and families who live close to agricultural areas are also at increased risk of childhood cancers and other cancers. So um, supporting the, the, these other um, recall based studies. And so um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about glyphosate. Um, glyphosate, you were probably familiar with, as I said, is the active ingredient in Roundup, and it's um, the number one um, most applied herbicide weed killer um, in the country. Um, and you can see the um, you know incredible increase in the application of um, glyphosate-based herbicides in the across the United States. Um, you know, particularly in agricultural land um, since the 1990s. Um, we did not, um, for until very recently, we were not monitoring um, glyphosate exposure in the general public, um, but we have just started to do that and um, find that more than 80% of the general population is exposed to glyphosate. Um, recent studies have found glyphosate um, in foods, including foods that that children consume, um, like Cheerios. Um, and again, looking like there's higher exposure in children. Um, and the issue here is that um, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is the, the cancer research arm of the World Health Organization, um, classified glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. Um, the EPA um, countered that. Uh, the US EPA uh, did not agree uh, based on the evidence that we have that um, glyphosate is a carcinogen, um, but here we are. Um, and so this is just to show you some studies of agricultural workers, not only from the United States agricultural health studies, um, but from similar studies in France and in Norway. Um, so these are multiple um, different cohorts of farm workers showing increased risk of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so we really, you know, don't have a complete handle on exposure in the general population and risk in the general population. But from these farm worker studies, um, you know, we do have an increasing am amount of evidence that links glyphosate use to cancer. And so for this reason, Fortunately, a lot of communities um, have been looking to phase out or replace um, glyphosate with other um, strategies. And in addition to cancer, there are epidemiological studies that have shown um, disrupted reproductive development, um, interference with the microbiome, um, which has implications for immune dysfunction and cardiovascular disease, um, as well as autistic-like behaviors in rodent studies. So there continues to emerge um, more and more data on the negative health impacts of glyphosate. So those are some of the active ingredients. And I just wanted to show you again, um, a, a typical, a couple of typical pesticide labels. Um, this is a pyrethroid permethrin, um, which is one of the most commonly applied um, pesticide chemicals for ticks. Um, and permethrin um, also contains 30% of the, or this 
product, um, a hyperbutoxide. So that is one of those synergists that I mentioned before that uh, makes the pesticide more potent and allows it to stick, al stick around longer. Um, we also call it PBO. Um, and I mention this because um, studies have shown that exposure to um, to this chemical is actually associated um, with increased risk of asthma and increased risk of um, behavioral problems and potentially impaired neurodevelopment um, in children. So it again, it may not be the active ingredient or only the active ingredient that is a concern um, for health. And this is another example um, of a glyphosate containing herbicide um, where you can see that 60, you know, almost 64% of this product um, are other ingredients or inert ingredients, and you don't know what they are. Um, so it's very difficult to take a look at this and say, you know, this is what I'm getting exposed to, or, um, you know, these are the health risks of using this product. So shifting gears, and there will be time at the end for, for questions. I know this is a lot of information, um, but um, shifting gears for a second to talk about um, something that's really important right now. Um, and I kind of alluded to it when I was talking about climate change and that is insect-borne disease. And um, so, you know, tick-borne and mosquito-borne illnesses are absolutely a public health threat. Um, that do need to be addressed and that we do need to protect ourselves and our families from. And so um, this is something that we get a lot of questions about. Um, and um, I actually live in Connecticut and grew up in Connecticut. And so um, I, you know, experience these concerns all the time with my own family um, and note that, you know, there is somewhat of a frenzy um, every year um, to have your lawn sprayed to protect your family from ticks. And I, and I understand that kind of fear. So this is a, this is an ad for 1946 that I just thought was really um, fascinating because I think we've, you know, we've had these fears for a long time. Uh, this is um, a, a wallpaper for your children's room um, that's treated with DDT to kill flies, mosquitoes, and ants, um, you know, and, and here, here we're saying, you know, against disease carrying insects. I think it's important to note actually not all insects are disease carrying. I think there are probably people on this call that can appreciate that. Um, and so, you know, the sort of like insects as the enemy um, storyline I think has been around for a really long time. Um, and sometimes they're just a nuisance and, um, you know, not, not actually something that are, or, and, and often they're beneficial. And we can talk about that too. Um, so at any rate today, um, you know, we're not that much different um, in the way that, um, you know, parents and families are really um, sort of targeted by the pesticide industry to make sure that you are protecting um, your kids and your and your pets from um, from insect borne diseases by applying chemicals that we might argue are actually um, harmful to our children and our pets. Um, and so, but so what's the reality? And I took a look at um, some of what Massachusetts is reporting um, related to um, mosquito-borne illness and tick-borne illness. And this is um, this is from last week, actually September twentieth. And so you can see, um, you know, that there are sort of hot spots. Um, I think most communities in in our area do um, very active surveillance essentially year round now um, so that they can pick up on um, risk and then potentially um, you know implement community-wide strategies like mosquito spraying in some cases um, to try to to try to get ahead of this and, and protect the population. Um, we also have eastern equine encephalitis. Um, and so you can see where, as of last week, um, they were estimating, you know, what which counties in Massachusetts were estimating um, a, a risk. And, and it looks like a lot of that is concentrated around Worcester for whatever reason. Um, so they kind of do this kind of surveillance um, so that they can um, make decisions about mosquito control. Um, and then again, you know, again, thinking about um, climate impacts, this is the reported tick-borne illness that we've seen in our region from 2001 up to, to 2014. And that's pretty scary, actually. Um, reported Lyme disease cases have dramatically increased. Um, I, you know, in my lifetime, it's always been a really big deal in Connecticut, but you can see how the range um, has really expanded um, very far north. 
Um, and again, in Massachusetts, um, this is where they're, um, this was from just January to July um, of this year. So not, um, so not a complete year yet, um, but seeing a number of emergency department visits for, for tick exposures um, in various counties across the state. So what can we do? This is the black-legged tick um, at various developmental stages. Um, and this is the tick that transmits Lyme disease. And um, you can see that they have this, um, this year-round life cycle um, where during the spring um, they're hatching and they're in their um, nymph phase and early summer. Um, they may be in their larval phase. And so that's when they're really, really tiny and much harder to detect. And that's why we see, um, you know, a, a increasing incidence from the spring and into the summer um, of more Lyme disease diagnoses, because this is when we're kind of missing. It's really easy um, to miss those little tiny ticks on ourselves and on our kids. Um, and here you can see that um, these are, this is Lyme disease cases by age and by sex. And you can see that, you know, on some of the youngest children, um, you see the greatest um, rates of Lyme disease. Um, not too surprising given, you know, their behaviors out of doors. Um, this um, this incidence of, of Lyme disease and other tick-borne born illness um, is really expanding um, as we're seeing um, tick season become much less predictable. You know, I'm constantly hearing in my community, like it's January and I just pulled a tick off of myself. Um, and so we really have to um, think about year round tick protection now. So what can we do to prevent um, tick bites? Um, and generally we recommend, we give a number of recommendations to families um, that start with, um, you know, chemical free, um, strategies that you can take. So these are things like wearing long pants and light colors and staying in the centers of trails like this. This this kind of setting um, always makes me cringe when I'm out with my family. Um, but ticks do not jump or fly. And so it's really brushing up against the, you know, the edges of um, vegetation that, um, that are where you acquire acquire ticks. Um, so trying to stay away from that kind of vegetation is helpful. And then um, when you come inside, immediately take off your clothes and put them in the dryer on high heat for at least 10 minutes. Do a tick check. Very important. My kids are super good at this now on their own. I have eight-year-old twins um, and they tell me to look between their toes. <laughs> um, so they, they know the routine um, after we've been outside and taking a shower as soon as possible. And then in your yard, there are steps you can take um, like mowing frequently and keeping grass short. Um, ticks like to be um, in um, piles of wood and debris. Um, so not keeping, you know, not keeping those on your property, keeping host animals like small rodents out of your property, um, and then keeping the areas where your children play away from those property edges. And um, some people also install like a gravel or a mulch barrier around their property. Um, sometimes you need other strategies um, and particularly in areas where, um, you know, you have high rates of tick-borne illness, which I think all of us are in those areas now. Um, we do recommend safe use of tick repellent when it's needed. Um, the diseases that are transmitted by ticks, including Lyme disease, are really serious and can lead to lifelong debilitation. So we certainly um, need to do kind of a you know, risk benefit analysis here. Um, and so what we recommend is that you know, always using um, insect repellents according to um, directions only on a exposed skin, um, avoid aerosols because, you know, like I mentioned, kids are really prone to breathing that kind of stuff in. Um, the, the active ingredient DEET in insect repellents actually has a very good safety profile, which people are very surprised to hear, but it's one of the um, insect repellents that's been used for the longest time. It's been um, shown in studies to be safe for use in pregnant women, but what's really important is to use the lowest um, percentage possible. There is no need to use um, 
a decontaining product, you know, for most of us and most of what we do in our daily lives, um, greater than 20%, really, um, this will, la you know, if you um, apply this um, properly, it will last for as long as five hours. So there's no need to like continually be reapplying. Um, and you can actually purchase products on Amazon that are 100% DEET. Those are not meant to be used on your skin. They don't really give you extra protection. Please don't use those. Um, some of the um, some of the products are even you know as low as as seven percent D, and I've used those and found those to be effective. Um, another um, another safe active ingredient is oil of lemon eucalyptus. It has not been tested in children under the age of three, so it's not recommended for children under the age of three. Um, Picardin is another is another one that that um, that some people use. And then um, on your property, um, the use of tick bait boxes has actually been shown um, to be very effective. Um, and so these enclose a pesticide um, inside of a box that a mouse, um, you know, a host animal can enter and the host animal will actually be treated um, with the pesticide. Um, and it's a much more targeted and, and restricted um, pesticide application. And some people have also found cedar oil um, applied to their lawn to be very effective. Um, and so I'm just gonna say um, one or two things about mosquitoes, um, you know, which as I said, are carrying West Nile virus, um, EEE. Um, in the past, we had a, a scare with Zika, um, which, is, which is actually carried by a different type of mosquito. Um, and so we really are seeing um, changes to mosquito season. I mentioned this earlier about the um, dramatic increase in mosquito activity following hurricanes. Um, we now have um, a huge number of what are considered mosquito days where um, where um, you know we reach an optimal temperature and humidity for mosquito activity. Um, so in the Northeast, that's at 129 days per year now. So you really are seeing mosquitoes um, far longer than we used to. And it's predicted that West Nile, vi vi West Nile virus cases, um, you know, at this rate will double by the year 2050 at $1 million per year in healthcare costs and premature deaths. Um, so this is a pretty serious situation. Um, I'm not going to say a huge amount of this about this right now. Um, but, you know, we, we, again, just like with ticks talk about, um, best practices. And so these are things, um, you know, personal protection and non, non chemical strategies. One is, um, limiting your time outdoors, um, at dawn and dusk when, um, when mosquitoes tend to be most ac active outside, or at least the mosquitoes that carry West Nile, um, you know, using um, things like mosquito netting, you can put mosquito netting over a stroller, stroller for example. Um, a next level of, of protection might be, uh, you know, judicious use of an insect repellent, like I mentioned, um, using larvicides, removing standing water from your property and, or, um, you know, treating and communities do this often, hopefully as a first line of defense um, in really wet areas um, would be to apply a larvicide, which has, um, you know, much fewer human health um, and environmental impacts than using mosquito spray, adulticides, which often are pyrethroid chemicals, like I mentioned previously, that may be applied um, from trucks um, by spraying around the neighborhood on the ground or even by aerial spraying um, from planes. And so I just wanted to say one thing about um, community mosquito spraying in Massachusetts, in case you all are unaware, um, is that you can opt out from these types of wide area pesticide applications. Um, you have to renew this every year. Um, I think it expires at Decem on December 31st every year, um, but you can go online to the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board um, and give your address. And then you have to actually, maybe there are people on this call that have done this before, because um, I haven't, I don't live in Massachusetts, but you have to, I think, mark your property um, as well. And um, you should get notification um, of when spraying is gonna happen. Um, so that's an interesting program that that Massachusetts has. 
Um, and so I just wanted to point you to um, resources that we have. We have a program called Prescriptions for Prevention. Um, when I'm done, I can put a link in the chat. Oh, actually at the end, I have a QR code, but I can also give you a link. Um, we have these for a number of environmental exposures. These are from our New York State Children's Environmental Health Centers uh, network, and they really give sort of um, just a bullet point action plan, um, simple steps that you can take. And so these would have our recommendations on insect repellent use, some of which I described, and then um, additional resources. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about now is uh, behavior change, right? And so that can be very effective at decreasing exposure, at least you know for you and your individual family. Um, but to really get to you know move the market, which as we see is a huge market with many many products, um, we have to apply market pressure. I think um, you know organizations like those that are represented here today um, are doing a great job. Um, at educating communities and trying to support, um, you know, organic land management companies and practices. Um, and so we kind of have to, you know, make sure that we're putting our dollars into those industries. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we need stronger regulations at the municipal level. We're seeing more and more of that, um, you know, also at the state level, fewer exemptions um, for use of these products, for example, on golf courses. Um, and so on. So these are really, it's kind of like a three prong strategy that we need to take so that we can protect all of the most vulnerable communities. I actually um, live in, in a community, you know, similar to the Levittown image with, with small properties that are all um, very close to one another. Um, and so I see the yellow signs go up, you know, up and down um, my street. And if I have weeds, um, you know, I'm going to stand out from everyone else. So um, it can be very challenging. Um, on the plus side, um, you know, to start leaving you with some good news, um, there are steps that you can take. We know that um, we have, a, there are a number of studies now showing that um, consuming more organic produce can help us reduce the burden of pesticides that are in our bodies. Um, and so switching just for a short time, actually, to an organic diet, um, I want to say this study was maybe um, seven days. Um, you could see that there was a dramatic decrease of a number of common pesticides, including the ones that I just talked about, um, in the bodies of, of these participants. <clears throat> and then there are some really easy, simple steps. You know, I talked about the fact that we can track pesticides into our home. So just taking off your shoes or, or wiping your shoes, um, leaving strollers and, and wheeled luggage outside the house or, or um you know, um, inside and not bringing them in, in or inside your door, not bringing them into your house. Um, there are studies that were done by the EPA that actually have shown this to be um, an effective way to reduce the presence of pesticide inside your house. Um, once they come into your house, like I said, they can persist for a while, um, accumulate in dust and so on and so forth. Um, so this is a great way to reduce chemical exposures inside your home. Really basic, you know, hand washing, with plain soap and water, um, eliminating dust, like I said, pesticides and a lot of other chemicals from consumer products can, um, can accumulate in dust. And so just a simple wet mopping um, can, can eliminate a lot of that inside the home. Supporting organic, um, but not only USDA organic, um, which can be expensive and sometimes hard to find in certain communities, but also um, going to farmers markets and talking to farmers about their practices. And a lot of them are using, um, you know, a limited use or, um, you know, just biopesticides or, um, you know, and so you can really, I think it's important to, to try to support um, local farmers that are doing the right thing. Um, and then, you know, inside the home, we didn't really talk in New York City, we talk a lot about um, pests in the home and pest control inside the home um, and integrated pest management. And so, you know, keeping pests outside of your home by um, using like well-sealed food containers and sealing up cracks and crevices so that they can't come in um, can all be really effective strategies to reduce pesticide chemical exposures. Um, again, I said, you know, like in my, this is actually my grass, a uh, patch of my grass, you know, normalizing this, um, normalizing the presence of clover and weeds, and we don't have to have a perfect lawn. Um, this is a sign actually from um, the advocacy group Beyond Pesticides, who uh, are one of our partners. Um, and so, you know, broadcasting that 
your property is pesticide free and it's still green and beautiful. Um, I mentioned that you know we're not going to really get to where we want to be um, until we have stronger regulations, um, and so the, these are some of the. Um, yeah, it's probably very hard to see this, um, but these are um, bills that were introduced last year <laughs> that all involved um, pesticide chemical restrictions, and I believe um, you know I mentioned that that uh, Massachusetts has restricted neonicotinoid use by consumers. Um, there's also a, um, a glyphosate review, um, scientific review that's undergo that's that's happening in Massachusetts. And um, there may be others um, here who wanna speak to some of the um, you know, pending legislation that you can maybe support either um, you know, within your own community or statewide. We've done a lot of this um, in New York City and elsewhere. Um, and I'm really happy to say that after several years of advocacy, New York City um, bans synthetic pesticide use in um, all parks and city properties. Um, Philadelphia um, did something similar and that's, this is really amazing. And actually um, in conversations before, uh, we were talking about Chip Osborne. Um, Chip Osborne is like the, um, the foremost expert in organic land management. He's from Massachusetts and has done a lot of work in Massachusetts. And he um, partnered um, with, this is Jay Feldman, who's the um, director of Beyond Pesticides, um, with Beyond Pesticides to train New York City park workers in organic land management. And this has just been um, a really incredible and very exciting initiative to be involved with. Um, and this is my, my colleague, Megan Horton, um, testifying, I think this one was in Maryland, um, on um, and, and elsewhere on bans on that organophosphate uh, pesticide chlorpyrifos that I mentioned previously um, that was even shown to be, um, to interfere with, with brain structure and function. Um, so a lot of movement um, takes a long time, um, but but still a lot of movement around pesticide restrictions. Um, so like I said, there is good news. I always try to end on good news um, in you know the form of restrictions and and more community education, um, organic sales. There's a lot more organic foods that are available. Um, a lot of the pesticides that I just talked about actually um, do not persist in the environment for as long as something like DDT does um, or accumulate in our body. So like I said, when you um, switch over to an organic diet or stop using some of these pesticide products, um, you rapidly reduce um, the levels of those pesticides in your body. So, um, so that's really encouraging. Um, and then lastly, just the idea that, you know, we're looking more, I talked about the exposome, um, the totality of everything that you're exposed to. Um, and so we're looking more at how positive exposures and a, a positive, healthy environment, good nutrition, social supports, um, enrichment for kids, how all those things um, can help to mitigate risk from some of these negative things in our environment. Um, and so with that, I will, I, I can um, share these links as well, but um, just wanted to direct you to where we have educational materials um, through our Mount Sinai site, also through, again, that New York State Children's Environmental Health Center, where we have a number of prescriptions. Um, these are just examples of some infographics and fact sheets, and we have um, materials for youth as well, if that's something that anyone is interested in. Um, and we are on social media in various places, um, Sinai Exposomics and Nice Check and our PESU. Um, so we can we can share those again, or or maybe um, the organizer organizers can share them again. And so that's all that I have, and um, I'm happy to take questions. And I will um, see if I can stop sharing as well. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Evans. This has been you know, a, a wealth of resource in such a short time. Um, I know I have a lot of questions, but I think we'll start with the audience. Um, and uh, in the Q and A, um, there's some interesting questions. Um, 
that I'll try to do justice to. Um, Clint Richmond of Sierra Club. You mentioned organochlorines. But about one third of the approximately 1,200 active ingredients use another halogen, fluorine. So organic organofluorines with this with many of these qualifying as PFAS. How much additional risk do you think these fluorinated pesticides pose? Oh, that's a that's a great question. That's a, and, it, um, it's a heavy one. One that uh we talk about PFAS in a lot of different settings. Um and that's a really good point that I um have not incorporated into this presentation, but probably should. Um, right. So per and polyfluoroalkylated substances, PFAS chemicals, many people know them as the Teflon chemical. Um, and uh, this is a beast of a, a beast of an of a class of chemicals that maybe you know includes like 15,000 chemicals now. They're in uh, many, many products. So they're so they're um they're used in um, stain proofing, waterproofing, grease proofing. Um, and I think that, you know, in the last few years, we've started to get a handle on all of the products that they're in. And one of them is pesticides. Um, and so, so yes, they, they increase risk. And again, talking about um, yeah. not knowing what's in them. Um, PFAS are really insidious because um, they're certainly not going to be on the label. Um, and the way to find out, um, if you're lucky, um, you can call them a manufacturer and they'll tell you, you know, you can say, are you using any PFAS chemicals? And even then they can be a little bit cagey and they'll say, well, we're not using PFOA. We're not using PFOA. Um, so, um, so yes, they've been shown to be in pesticide chemicals. Um, they're associated with um, certain cancers um hormone disruption immune system dysfunction um negative birth outcomes um on the immune system side i think one of the most interesting findings related to pfas um is that they um they interfere with vaccine response um and so <laughs> children who had higher levels of of pfas exposure had a lower response to vaccination um which was which is really relevant, you know, in the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, there were also some studies that showed that um, PFAS exposure was associated with, with worse COVID-19 outcomes. So, um, so I don't know if I'm answering the question, except to say that, that yes, that's a really big problem. Um, I will say that PFAS are increasingly being regulated in a number of products, um, various consumer products. The state of Connecticut, um, recently um, banned them for use in all types of uh, food packaging and consumer packaging. Um, mm. And so, you know, that's kind of a, a, you know, one product, one chemical at a time um, issue. The, the US EPA um, just proposed, in, there have never been enforceable standard, standards for drinking water, but they just proposed um, enforceable and very, very low drinking water standards, but it only applies to six PFAS of, you know, the entire chemical universe. So we're slowly mm -hmm. starting to restrict PFAS use in various products, but it's a very, very big issue to tackle. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, except to say it's a problem and, and they're there. Um, yeah. And so just another source of PFAS exposure. I think you give an excellent overview and a very thorny issue that cuts across um, disciplines. So thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Richmond also asks another specific question. You mentioned chlorophyos. No, I'm saying it wrong. Chlorophyros. Chlorophyros. Yeah. Thank you. But that I only read it. I don't say it. Um, but that's a sad example of the slow speed and confusing regulations that the EPA has pursued. While consumers can try to avoid problematic pesticides, do you think the EPA is, do is going to start following a more holistic and precautionary approach to pesticide regulation? Is the research uh, community helping the EPA better mm -hmm. address pesticide risks? Thank you so much. Yeah, so... Um... 
I'm not super optimistic about that. Um, it's a huge problem. It takes a very, very long mm-hmm. time. Um, you know, chlorpyrifos was um, restricted for use in residential products. Um, mm-hmm. So it was used, it was used um, as like a cockroach um, repellent in um, homes. Um, so it used to be that you could buy it um, for use at home highly again highly neurotoxic um and that mm-hmm. that use was banned because we had evidence that it was highly neurotoxic um but it was continued to be permitted for other uses like on in agriculture and on golf courses um and so mm-hmm. um then um various states you know tried to put through bans and it looked like something was going to happen with the EPA and then it didn't happen in the last administration. And then, you know, finally, um, there's been action around that, but that's really inefficient. And in the meantime, you know, we have decades of exposure and environmental contamination. Um, and so, but in terms of the regulation by class, that's something that um, a lot of environmental advocacy groups have been um, have been pushing for and asking regulatory agencies um, to do that. Um, This applies to a lot of different chemicals. Um, Not to get off topic, but PFAS is certainly one of them. Um, Bisphenol A, for example, um, was what we call it regrettable substitution. Bisphenol A is an endocrine disrupting chemical that was, um, you know, present in baby bottles and aluminum cans and and a number of products. Um, And as that was restricted, it was replaced with a chemical called BPS, which has, you know, similar or worse um, health effects as BPA. So um, so it's recognized <laughs> that we need to go in that direction. Um, I don't, I'm, I haven't seen any indication that it's going to happen. I think a lot of that has to do with industry pushback and industry saying, no, we, you know, we can't do it. We can't make the product. We can't do this without something from this class of chemicals. And then saying, but you know, here so here's one that's less persistent or less toxic. Um, so we'll stop using the other one, but we'll use this one. There's many, many examples of that um, in in chemical regulation. And so just to say that yes, the scientific community um, is working on that um, and trying to support some of the environmental advocacy groups, um, you know, that spend a lot of time with regulatory agencies trying to get that kind of thing through. Um, and we've mm-hmm. seen we've seen some hopeful progress towards that, like at the state level, um, but at the federal level, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so much information and detail about um, pesticides and herbicides um, as Lexington Living Landscapes thinks about preserving the ecosystem for beneficial insects and living things. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the unintended consequences of using um, pesticides and then killing off beneficials that could be a natural um, check to unwanted pests. if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's, that's not my area of expertise. So (laughs) there may be others who, um, who can speak to that, um, you know, more eloquently, um, except to say that, um, you know, biodiversity is extremely important to human health. It's harder to measure. Um, I think it's hard, you know, to, 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 to describe that relationship really clearly or to do, um, you know, the types of studies that we do. Um, but yeah, so, you know, and I think a lot of people here know this, that um, many of, you know, these pesticides are not specific to ticks or specific to whatever that nuisance pest is that you're worried about. Um, and so they are, you know, also toxic to those beneficial insects um, and really kind of throwing off by using them, we're throwing off that natural balance um, that mm-hmm. that's needed, you know, like nature, if we let it do its thing, um, could take care of itself. And, and I think that's very cool, um, but I'm not an expert in that. So <laughs> maybe no someone else. Worries, no worries, no worries. Um, we can come back to that if if we have time. 
Um, but I want to continue with our our audience's questions. Um, one being, how do I get rid of Roundup? Well, I, so uh, I you, I mean, you know, on a on a personal level, you know, for your own property, um, you know, I would argue that it it's not needed. Again, I'm not an, a landscaping expert. Um, but I do know that there are strategies to, you know, reduce the presence of weeds or um, live with the weeds too. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that that we don't need it. And so part of that is the idea of shifting the norm um, away from having the perfect manicured yard. I think where there's a real challenge is when it comes to invasives. And I know that a lot of, um, you know, conservation commissions um, really do struggle to do the work that they need to do to get rid of invasives um, without using it. It's kind of like the go-to um, chemical for some of that. And so I haven't heard a lot of solutions from those communities. Um, mm. Oh, someone's saying hazardous waste. Is that, are they, is this a disposal question or a stop using question? Maybe I'm answering the yes. question wrong. <laughs> I wasn't sure either. <laughs> Um, we do have hazardous waste days here in Lexington, which yeah, you can find on the town website. Yes. But um, yeah, that's it. And I, so okay. I would say don't um, don't pour it down the drain. I don't think that's <laughs> and it, don't put no. it in the trash. <laughs> that's a um, this disposal. We aren't. I think there are hazardous waste days in Lexington, and I would direct our listeners to um the 10 website and or you know leave that question for I, I wasn't clear what the questioner meant but it's it's a good thing to uh distinguish let's see um yeah, there was another question that I oh uh he, on ticks how long does it take a tick to tr to treat it for it to transmit disease by doing twice daily tick checks when changing clothing. This seems to find ticks much earlier and even if attached is less risk of disease. Um, from Jean yeah. Regard. Yeah, the, and the general rule of thumb um, has been that, you know, if you, if you remove a tick um, within 24 hours, the risk that it has transmitted Lyme disease um, is pretty low, um, you know, and if it's sort of, you know, not fully, if you find it, it's not fully attached, it's not engorged with blood, um, that you're probably, th that it's probably okay. The only thing that I will say is that um, there are, you know, emerging tick-borne diseases in our area that we haven't, you know, seen as much in the past that there's some suggestion that it, they may transmit the uh, bacteria more quickly. Um, hmm. So that's, so, so that's a little bit tricky, but, you know, generally that has been, you know, if it's, if it's not fully embedded, if it's not engorged, if it's less than 24 hours. So the, the best, um, you know, the, the best strategy is frequent checks and, um, you know, pulling them off and really like, you know, again, like, between the toes, behind the ears, um, all those places where a really small tick can go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to bring uh, Sarah Buffel Allen in for a moment, if you are able, Sarah, because I think you have some great questions. Hmm. Um, Sorry, I was just sending them. I thought you would ask them, but I'm happy to. Hi again. I um, think it's nice to have you uh, chime in. Thanks. I had a couple things on my mind. Um, one was just the nuts and bolts of of um, non chemical tick management. One of the approaches that you um, reasonably suggested is the frequent mowing and keeping the vegetation pretty low around your house because. As we know, the ticks are on the tall grass and they're waiting for someone to walk by and brush up against it to hitch a ride. As you mentioned, they don't 
they do not jump and they do not fly. I want everyone to be calm, calm about that. Um, but one of the things that we're also trying to do is have more native vegetation and growing more native plant meadows on parts of our property, which grow to between one and like six feet tall, depending on the species and the sunlight and other conditions. And so there's like a little bit of an inherent conflict between those two goals, one of managing disease um, prevention and one of, um, you know, managing loss of biodiversity and trying to um, restore some of that. Um, and so I guess the approach that I, I'm trying to take at my own home, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how effective you think this would be with highly mobile children, uh, which I also have. <laughs> is to um, just keep the areas closer to the house, more highly managed, that is with the, the frequent mowing and have more periphery areas or discrete areas where you have more of these meadow of native plant species going. What's your experience with that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I thought I thought you were also going to say, um, you know, like allude to no mow may and not using well, hopefully not using gas powered lawn equipment anyway, which is another topic, but, um, but, and also, um, you know, keeping grass longer can, can crowd out weeds, right? Like that's, an, that's sometimes is a recommendation, keep your grass longer, um, to avoid more weed growth. But, um, yeah, so I, I totally understand that conflict. I mean, what, one thing, um, I wonder is if you can, if it's possible, I know it's so hard in any way to restrict like access to your property, by small ruins, almost impossible, right? <laughs> they can get under anything. Um, but um, also I think the the tick checks, I mean, I think there's like so much value in, in what you're doing um, where I do think that the benefits outweigh the risk and you can, you know, use other strategies um, to reduce the presence of, of ticks on your property. You could think about, you know, if you were comfortable with that kind of pesticide use, like the tick bait boxes around, around your property. I know people have had a lot of success with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that's like a great example of, you know, really excellent stewardship and bringing back natives. And, um, I think that's important too. Thanks. And I appreciate your point that tick checks and just timely removal of ticks is a really effective strategy. I mean, a lot of us like to go for walks in conservation lands where obviously there's tall vegetation there as well. And while I do try to keep my kids as much as possible on the, on the center of the trails, there's places where it's not possible not to brush up against vegetation. And for sure, the kids want to run off trail and jump off rocks and all of those things. So um, you don't want to, you know, prevent your kids from doing those kinds of activities. Um, and so tick, techs, uh, tick checks are a really valuable uh, approach as well. Um, another thing I was wondering about, I, I appreciate what, that you shared the sort of community environment in which your home is located and the social pressure um, that you're experiencing just with integrating clover, which as far as like all the things that you could be doing to sort of rewild your lawn is clover is a fairly, um, inoffensive or you know like from your neighbor's perspectives perhaps uh, approach compared to some you know very tall or no mome would be much more you know stark difference um i think that's a challenge a lot of us encounter and it's such an important thing to have people you know realize they can stop with the grub control in almost every case um that it's really those are not problematic soil critters uh, and, and the poisons they're putting on to con control them are are really health problematic. So I was wondering if you had suggestions um, for conversations maybe you've had with your neighbors since you have this expertise on the effect of the biocides that, that they're using on their lawns. Um, have you been able to make inroads in changing some of your the local culture in your neighborhood? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's also sort of a benefit that everyone can see our property and our grass um, because it actually is very lush and thick and green. And we, um, you know, we've kind of gotten there by, you know, aerating it ourselves and, do, you know, overseeding and doing some of the things. I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> again, I'm not an expert in this, but we try things and things, you know, seem to work for us. Um, and we like actually one of our neighbors mowed our lawn when we were away and he was like, your grass is so thick. He was complaining about it too. That I was like, it took me so long because it's so thick. 
But it's like, so I, I think just, you know, demonstrating that, that it's possible. We don't use a landscaping company. I mean, we have a small property too, but we don't use a landscaping company. So we save money. We don't, you know, I mean, it's not a huge amount of labor, um, what, what we have. Um, so, you know, there's that argument and, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I, you know, we get jokes that I'm like the crazy person on the street <laughs> with my anti-pesticide stance, but, um, you know, we can joke about it, but I, but I think, you know, hopefully like gradually it, it, it comes across. I think another thing that's important um, is for towns, municipalities um, who are phasing things out or doing, you know, like some, I know some towns near me have put through ordinances to, um, you know, limit the use of pesticides on town property and you can't, um, you know, they can't make residents do that. Um, but they can make resources available, partner with, you know, sustainable um, committees um, to educate the community. Um, and I think once you see like, oh, wow, you know, like we have these, we actually have these beautiful fields, um, you know, athletic fields or whatever um, that are being maintained without chemicals. Like, I, I guess I could do that too. Um, and, you know, supporting, helping to support landscapers so that there are more landscapers available um, who know how to do this work. Um, so I don't know if that like fully answers your question. Um, I will say one challenge that I've encountered is that, um, some of my neighbors think that, um, what the, what's being applied to their property is pesticide free or is, um, is safe, you know, again, with that kind of like, it's a chrysanthemum flower product. Um, and so they really don't know, they don't have that education, which I under, you know, why would you know that you assume you're paying for something, they're telling you it's safe and natural, um, but it actually isn't. And so um, we, my neighbor used to have, a, you know, a flat every time the, the lawn maintenance company would come, the flag would go up and I would go out there and be like, why is this happening? My, you know, I have little kids. And um, the, the, um, and my neighbor said, oh, they told me it's just, they're just putting down fertilizer. Um, oh. but it clearly had like a pre-emerge, you know, it definitely had a pre-emergent in it, but they didn't, you know, that just wasn't, I was like, oh yeah, sure. We'll fertilize your lawn. We'll do. So it's really hard. I think that, um, you know, and I, I give people the benefit of the doubt too, that they actually don't know, uh, they just pay for the service and they don't like really know what's being applied. And sometimes the applicators don't know either, which is even scarier. Um, one told me it's just yeah. a mild pesticide and I got the name and it was like 24D and something else, you know, it was like, so. It's yeah, a I think that that uh, lack of knowledge and uh, both from residents and from municipalities. Um, and it makes me think too of the um, effects of pesticides and herbicides beyond our own lawn or the agricultural fields, but into our waterways, um, which is kind of scary. You know, the chemical load in our waters. Yeah, I think um, I, and I live near the Sound, the Long Island Sound. So, um, so I, that's another factor. And I, I think, um, Another thing that I found is that um, people may not be concerned about like a child's exposure on their property, but they are concerned about, you know, the health of the Long Island Sound or they're concerned about their dogs mm -hmm. or um, yeah. so, so there are a lot of different avenues, I think, to influence um, people's thought process around the chemicals that they're using. Um, so, you know, I've spoken to communities alongside um like a like a veterinarian um who's advocating for you know safe and healthy pets because that some right. people you know don't have kids on their property but they do have a dog um mm -hmm. so there's a lot of different mm -hmm. angles i think a great point uh, um there was a question about how to get your neighbors to cooperate on uh, to stop spreading these chemicals. Um, and any examples of, you know, municipalities that have passed ordinances to limit this on private property. 
if that you're um, aware of. Yeah, no, because um, typically they cannot legally do that um, because of preeminent law. So um, unfortunately, they can only make it like a suggestion. So I don't know of any. Uh, that might not be there. May there might be one or two, but typically, no. It, it, they legally cannot um, pass that kind of um, restriction on private property. You know, so only on. Um, municipal properties, unfortunately. But I think, um, you know, the other thing, just kind of going back to the point about convincing neighbors, um, and I think this is sort of with any anything related to environmental exposures, um, is not shaming them, you know, and, um, you know, kind of going in with the assumption that you're educating, um, maybe they didn't know, um, you know, or lead with like, I have a small you know, I have a small child, maybe you don't, but like, the, you know, that what you're doing on your property is going to come over onto my property and um, yeah. go enter, lead yeah. with compassion first, I think, rather than yeah. Um, shame. Yeah, makes so much sense. Um, I see that we're drawing close to the end. Um, and we're just so appreciative of your time this evening and your you know, uh, expertise and your devotion to this topic, which isn't always easy for folks to take in. So you make it so accessible and, uh, uh, just am very thankful for your, um, Oh, somebody's chimed in. Um, I will just say this and then I, I want to turn it over. Um, there's a proposed law in mass for local control, an act empowering towns and cities to protect residents and the environment from harmful pesticides by Moran. And so that is in the chat, um, which we will save and I believe can be um, sent out. But with that, and thank you so much for that. That's also Clint Richmond. Um, Vermont yeah, and and another another us. plug too. I, I just want to give like another plug to everyone to get involved in you know that kind of advocacy. Um, your elected officials do want to hear from you, and um, and it's impactful to um, you know because and I have learned from doing this kind of work that you know the industry will show up with their scientists and their lobbyists and the, you know and so it's just really important to have as many voices as possible. Um, supporting that kind of legislation mm -hmm. um another uh, attendee uh recommends the bug baffler net suit which works great to keep out ticks and bugs so if you're a, a you know involved in the outdoors um that's another barrier mechanism um, but with that i will turn this over to matt uh thank you so much uh, Dr. Evans, it's really terrific presentation. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Dr. Evans and Marsha and Sarah for organizing this and all the other co-sponsors. Um, this program was uh, recorded and will be on the library's YouTube channel um, in the next coming days. And uh, we'll send out a link uh, with the information that was in the chat tonight, like the the bill and some of the links. and. Um, also links to Lexington Living Landscapes website and whatnot. But thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Evans, for sharing all of your uh, incredible work with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. To be continued. Bye. <laughs> have, a, have a good evening, everyone.